Hello viewers, I am Mamta. Today we are going to do class 12 chapter number 4, Psychological Disorders. This carries 10 marks weightage according to CBSE. The topic that we are going to do today is the concept of abnormality and the history of abnormality. Now let me ask you a question. If you see somebody walking on the road, laughing to himself and walking to some imaginary figures, do you consider that as normal? Do you consider appearance of ghost in cultures who can see ghost, is that normal? This is how we are going to start and understand with what is meant by abnormality. Now there are four D's in abnormality that we have to consider and these four D's are dysfunction, danger, distress and deviance. Danger means a person who is going to be of some harm to society or to his own self. So self-aggression, suicide, or harming somebody else, violence on outside figures. So that is what danger refers to. If there are four Ds present, then obviously we consider that particular person as having traits of abnormality. Dysfunction here refers to those features which interfere with a person's normal functioning. For instance, all of us are able to eat food by ourselves, all of us are able to dress up on our own, all of us are able to tie our own laces, we are able to talk meaningful sentences. We are able to follow our daily routine. But people who are having traces of abnormality are not able to follow up their regular daily functioning. They face a lot of problems, a lot of interruption, a lot of interference with their daily routine. Third feature, the third D is distress. If the features or the behaviors the person is experiencing is very very unpleasant to the person or very very upsetting to the person that feature is known as distress so it is very stressful to the person the last d is known as the deviance now deviance means the very word refers to deviation from normal so deviation from normal would be in a particular culture what is acceptable and what is not acceptable is normal so in one particular culture, ghosts might be acceptable as a normal feature, but in the other culture, it may not be acceptable. So every culture has a norm, has an unsaid rule for the way people are supposed to behave in that particular culture. So behaviors which are different from those unsaid rules set by society, the code of conduct set by society, those behaviors, reactions which are extreme, which are unusual, which are very, very bizarre, are again not acceptable according to the norms set by the society. So they are deviant behaviors. The very concept of abnormality, if you look at it, it is something which is away from normal, which is, you know, there's a very thin line between normality and abnormality. That is why the four Ds we have discussed are going to help us understand it. But it's a very relative concept of abnormality away from normal. We also call it as psychopathology. Like you have pathology or germs or viruses in the body, similarly when the mind gets affected it is psychopathology. We also call it mental illnesses or mental disorders. So like the body can suffer from any kind of diseases, similarly when the disease is there in the mind we call it mental illness or the disorder of the mind when it is not in perfect harmony or not in perfect order. That is about abnormality. Let's understand the two approaches that we've just understood from the four Ds. Following up from there, the two approaches, one deals with the concept of deviance, that is deviation from the social norms. And the second recent concept which has been emerging from researchers is the concept of adaptability or maladaptability or maladjustment. Now, when we talk about a normal behavior, we say that a person not just is working for his growth, his survival, he's also working for his fulfillment, for his self-actualization, which Maslow's theory talked about. So here we are not just talking about the aspect of the person is able to cure himself a certain problem. We are also talking about that person is able to maintain his well-being. So this is a concept where we say that a person is able to manage himself in a healthy manner, in a normal manner, in an everyday life rather than curing himself of the problem. So this is where the person is able to handle the challenges of life, adjusting himself, moving on smoothly with those challenges and able to maintain his sanity, his well-being and his stability. That is the recent concept of maladjustment. One major concern that we have related to abnormality is the stigma associated with it. 
Now, if somebody tells you that you need to visit a psychiatrist or a psychologist, how many people will be actually willing to go ahead and get themselves tested or get themselves help from a psychiatrist or a psychologist? That is one major concern because a lot of stigma is attached to the concept of abnormality. Even in a school, when a child goes to a counselor, everybody asks him that, you know, are you mad? Is it normal? Are you having some major problem that you're going to a psychologist or a counselor? So that is one stigma attached. If you tell somebody that I'm visiting a psychiatrist, there's a big stigma attached. What will people say? This person is mad, crazy or lunatic. But that is not the case. It is just that you're stuck up somewhere. You're facing some discomfort and you're going to take help from somebody who's an expert in the field. So it's always healthy and helpful when you are able to tell somebody what your problem is and the person who's an expert is able to help you and come out of it. So it's always a very good step taken. Okay, let's move on to the concept of history. How did this whole study of abnormality emerge? This is what we're going to understand in this particular topic. Now, this has separate approaches, various themes that we're going to understand. First of them, in fact, these three major themes that we are going to talk about right in the beginning is a concept of Western psychology, which is a very, you know, recurring theme of Western psychology. So, right from the time when we say that, suppose somebody's body is possessed by an evil spirit, that's a very common notion of abnormality. If somebody's, you know, there's this concept of bhut, preet and atma in a person's body, that is what we call as possession. This is the supernatural factor that we are considering here. This is what is normally taken as abnormality. So if it is in psychology, we call it abnormality, but in normal terms, when you talk about, we talk about magical terms or supernatural or priest related terms, we call it bhut, preet and atma and shaitan and all of that possessing the body. But this person needs treatment, so that needs to be considered again. People normally go to the ojhas and shamans and get the jharpus done. That is not a very scientific approach. They are able to maybe reduce themselves with the negative forces, but otherwise it's a, a treatment-based modality which needs to be considered. But this is normally how abnormality concepts started. Then it was understood that, you know, it is the brain and the body relation. So any problem with the brain, any problem in the functioning and the structures of the brain needs to be addressed the brain structures, the brain functioning. So this became a very scientific approach. That was a biological approach, which is known as also known as the organic approach, where the body and the mind and the brain functioning is understood. If there's any interference, any disturbance in their harmony functioning, that is understood. Now we have the psychological approach, the last approach in the Western recurring themes, which is talking about that how the psychological inputs affect the functioning of a person and how does it lead to abnormality. So we talk about if you are feeling inadequate in the way you think, in the way you feel and the way you perceive things, then again you need help because you are getting into the negative mode of thinking into a self-defeating, self-limiting pattern which needs consideration. Then we move on to the approaches which have been there in the ancient period, ancient western psychology. We start from the organismic approach. Now organismic approach is basically dealing with the aspect of Hippocrates who talked about the conflict between emotion and reason, that is the way I use my logic and the way I feel, there's a conflict between the two. So Hippocrates here talked about the four humors in the body, taking information from Galen who talked about the four humors. In Indian concept also we have the concept of Panch Bhut from which we say that our body is made of five elements. But here Hippocrates and Galen considered the four aspects. One was the air, the fire, the water and the earth. These four elements were considered if there's any imbalance in the body in relation to these four elements, it leads to abnormality. Similarly, Hippocrates talked about the four biles, the black bile, the yellow bile, the, the blood. These aspects were the main reason if there's any in disturbance in the body related, related to these four levels, it affects the temperament and it leads to abnormality or any kind of mental illness. Same concept continued with Ayurveda also. All the Ayurvedic physicians do this treatment with the doshas in the body, the vatpit kaf, the three doshas. Any imbalance based on the personality of the person results in a mental illness again. So that was the concept where we talk about the biological related aspects. Let's move on to the Middle Ages concept, what really happened at the time of Middle Ages. Now here the main concept was demonology, that was the main feature that any person behaving different or unusual was considered as a demon or a witch. Now they were into witch hunting, they were into killing those people who were labelled as witches if they were having any kind of abnormality. 
Now here St. Augustine did a very good work which laid the groundwork and the foundation for the rest of the psychological approaches. He understood this fact that such people are basically behaving that way because of a conflict within themselves, because of the interpersonal conflicts, because of their, the way they feel, their mental anguish and their frustrations. So all that needs to be addressed rather than labeling them and killing them. Then we moved on to the Renaissance period and in this period there was a very much improvement in the way the people were handled, people who were labeled as mentally challenged or mentally, mentally having any kind of disorder, they were handled in a very humane manner. That was a major contribution of this period. So the witches were considered as mentally disturbed, requiring treatment. Because here they understood, especially John Ware, he understood the fact that if somebody is behaving in an abnormal manner, it is basically because of the way they are dealing with each other. It's the interpersonal conflict which is resulting in all this rather than anything else. Then they moved on to the age of reason and enlightenment. This was particularly important because here the scientific concepts, scientific attitude were put into practice. Now as the name also suggests, the age of reason and enlightenment in history, it was basically to give logic to the whole aspect of abnormality and enlightenment in terms of understanding that it requires scientific treatment and treating them with humanness. You know, in this particular phase, before this phase particularly started, the people who were mentally ill were very much ill-treated. They were tied up in chains and they were put all put into one small cell and they were you know, not allowed to move anywhere, they were not allowed to meet anybody, go out and behave normally. So this was the kind of treatment they were given. They were left up in dark rooms. So This was the kind of treatment that they were given in mental asylums or mental hospitals. So this is where the humane movement started, where they were considered as people having a problem which needs treatment. Then they moved on to this phase further added on to the reform movement. Now this reform was not just with the way people were treated, but it was also where people were got back to their normal life. Because a lot of times families leave these people as they don't have time to take care of such people having any problem. Everybody is very busy with their normal life. So such people, because they need special attention and families do not have time or resources, they just put them into hospitals and ultimately they are there in the hospitals only. But when this reform movement came in, it was understood that if a person needs to get back to normal society, after treatment, it is very important that they need to be rehabilitated into the family and also into the setup where they can work and lead a normal life. So this was the aspect of deinstitutionalization, where they were put out of the community, put out of the hospitals and put back into the community as a normal life. So with this approach, we understood that reform movement led to a phase which was deinstitutionalization where a person was able to go back to the community, start up with work, deal with the family and have a normal life after getting treatment and after getting better where he did not need hospitals and he only needed a normal life and normal people. So we understand that this approach in totality is known as the biopsychosocial approach which is also known as the interactional approach. The bio refers to the bodily processes the neurotransmitters, the psychological refers to all the components of conflict in a person's mind. It also refers to the interpersonal aspect that we understood, the emotion and the reason. So that was psychological. And social, of course, refers to the way family treats a person and the kind of conditions a person gets outside. So this is the interactional approach with which we summarize the history. Let's quickly wind up the last topic, which is the classification. Now, classification, we need to understand what is classification first. There is a list of categories in which the mental disorders are grouped so that different psychologists or social workers and psychiatrists, professionals can communicate as to what problem the person is facing based on the symptoms and therefore they can help these people by understanding what they are going through. So classification, there are two kinds of classification, very important ones. One is dsm 4 tr Now, this classification is uh, given by American Psychiatric Association. Now, there's a revision again in this classification, which is going to come out next year in DSM-5. DSM refers to Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Now, this is the fourth revision that we're talking about. Now, here it has five axes or five dimensions where they try and cover the, all the areas which we understood in interactional approach or biopsychosocial approach. We also have ICD-10, which is International Classification of Diseases. And here, ICD-10 is a 10th revision, and this is by WHO classification, which is accepted all over, all over the world. India particularly follows the ICD-10 classification. Now, ICD-10 again is being revised next year onwards. It will be ICD-11. 
and this classification system tries and involves all the different kinds of mental illnesses under its categories to help psychiatrists identify and understand what exactly is the person suffering from, what are the symptoms, how to label it and how to help these people work with them. So let's wind up for today's chapter. We understood the aspect of abnormality, what it means. We moved on to the concept of how it developed, how abnormality was understood and then we moved on to how do we list different uh, disorders and how do we help people understand that what are the different kinds of disorders in this classification system. That's about it for today. Thank you.